I'm going to throw up an image now, and I want you to, some of you are going to resonate with this image, some of you won't know at all what I'm talking about, and it'll show me how old you are. Uh, some of you are older than others. <clears throat> so this, now, some of you look at this, and this is just uh, you don't get this, you don't understand this. I'm telling you, as a child of the 80s, who was a uh, impressionable young person during that time, in the 80s and 90s, this was big stuff. Uh, in the 90s, a lot of times, if you gathered as a family on a Friday night or Saturday night, and, and you didn't have Netflix, you didn't have streaming, you didn't have those things, you went to Blockbuster. This was a video store. You actually had to go to a store, get a physical thing, put it in this thing called a VCR, fix the tracking, and watch a movie. And the big thing as a family, you'd go and you'd have to wrestle about what movie you got and those kind of things. Well, well Blockbuster monopolized for a, for a while, well past the decade, this process. They refined it, they processed it. If you remember, uh, how many of you had a Blockbuster video card how many of you still have it somewhere in your wallet, right? You haven't cleaned it out. Uh, you had Blockbuster cards. You had uh, late fees. Do you remember that glorious thing? Late fees. And then you had to make sure you rewound your video before you brought it back, before they went to DVDs. I mean, this place was a monster all the way through the 90s into 2004. They employed over 84,000 employees worldwide. They opened more than 9,000 stores worldwide. And so, and so no, there was hardly anybody in the United States that didn't know what this place was in the 90s and early 2000s. However, why this picture is significant is this represents the last blockbuster still open in the world. Uh, it is in Bend, Oregon, that makes sense. Uh, and I'm telling you, it's like a living museum. It still functions the way it did in 2000 with the same computer system, the same membership card, the whole thing. It's like it's stuck in time. It's, it's this fixed place in time that, that it's like this living museum that still goes on. Now, why do I bring up Blockbuster Video? Why do I bring up this relic of the past? because uh, this has resonance to what we're gonna study today in Sardis. The question should be asked, what happened to Blockbuster Video? How did it go from this monster nine plus billion dollar company, how did it go from this monster of a thing down to a last remnant of a store within 15 to 20 years? Now, you could say it was change in technology. I would always say it was the invention of online streaming and things like Netflix that, that put it out of business, but I think that was only partially true. What happened to Blockbuster Video happens often to uh, businesses and even churches is they grew complacent. What happened was Viacom bought Blockbuster Video and Blockbuster Video was making cash hand over fist. I don't know if that makes sense. They were making tons of money. And so Viacom took all the profits of that and they offset debt they had in another part of their portfolio. So instead of reinvesting in, in what Blockbuster was doing, they were taking all the profits and moving it other places, thinking that they could just keep rolling profits on this end. And so they stopped reinvesting in their own company. They grew complacent in their model when they had an opportunity to buy a fledgling new company called Netflix for a mere $50 million, which in 2000 was a lot of money. Uh, for, a, for a mere $50 million, they passed on it because they didn't have the, the financial means to actually do it. If they had done those things, we still might be streaming blockbuster videos, or videos, <laughs> streaming blockbuster movies today. Complacency kills. Apathy kills. And so when leadership let these kind of pitches go by, when leadership slowed down, allowing things to happen, it was a nail in the proverbial coffin for the video store that made blue and yellow so popular. 
The church at Sardis, what we're going to look at today, had the same type of DNA as Blockbuster Video. A church that at one point knew the truth and lived it out, but had let complacency and apathy creep in, setting up a glide path of slow, methodical death in their church. A blueprint of how a church dies, not from outside persecution, not from internal false teaching, but of magnified indifference, of sleepwalking through a battlefield. The only other church that rivaled the negative part of this church was Laodicea, which we'll look at in several weeks, but at least they thought they were still rich. The church at Sardis sounds the alarm for any church that has a, had a taste or measure of health, of growth, of sustainability, but allows itself to rest on what it has, to always look at the past and to try to hold on to what was instead of continuing to push hard into the future through truth and love. Now, before we read uh, this section in Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 1, I want to talk a little bit about the city of Sardis. Now, I will tell you what's been fascinating about this study is I had never really done a deep dive into the city of Sardis, to be honest with you. I know I went to seminary, but uh, they didn't teach you everything. And so doing a deep dive, it's fascinating that the geography of this city, the actual history of the city itself mirrors the downfall or the plight of the church. The city and the church faced similar issues. Here's what I mean. If you look at the city of Sardis, you can put uh, some of these pictures up. It's a fascinating thing. So here in the foreground, you have the lower part of the city. And in the background, you could see that big kind of mountainous range there. The city of Sardis was the main hub of the, of the area of Lydia. If you wanted to control Lydia, you controlled Sardis. They were on a trade route. Uh, it was a, uh, you could see, maybe Wayne, go to the next picture. You could see that if you controlled that part of the city where they would build a stronghold, a fortress, and go to the next one, and you look down, you could see they had a fortress up here and all around uh, you could siege this place, but you, they had a very narrow path into the actual upper city. And so to actually conquer this city militarily would have been nearly impossible. And I will say nearly. They had 1,500 foot sheer cliffs on three sides with just a narrow opening to get into the city itself. And that meant not only that it was a stronghold, but it meant it had a hard time growing beyond what it could be because it could only take up the land that was on top of this hill. But it also led the city to become complacent in their strength, in the strength of their geographical position. There were two major incidents in the city's past that are fascinating as we look at the actual text of the church. In 549 BC, Croesus, or Croesus, the king of Lydia, attacked Cyrus of Persia, and he got it handed to him. So the, the, the king of this, this city went and attacked the, the Persian king. He got whooped up really badly. He goes, no problem. I'm going to go back to my stronghold. I'm going to lick my wounds. I'm going to restock my, for, uh, my forces, and I'm going to wait for reinforcements. As he did that, Cyrus started to siege this city. So Cyrus uh, encamped around this mountain, and he was going to wait him out. And, and Croesus was like, dude, you can't get up here. We're fine here. We'll wait for other reinforcements to come. We're fine. So he slept fine at night. He went to bed dreaming of cliff jumping and, you know, whatever. What happened was Croesus was no dummy. He got an elite group of, of climbers who actually at night could scale these walls. They opened, they scaled these walls at a, at a pass that it was said that even a child could have defended this pass. 
Like a child could have thrown rocks down and stopped these soldiers from coming up, but they were so sure of what they had, they got complacent in actually defending themselves that, that Cyrus's soldiers got in, they opened the gates, and lo and behold, they lost this battle. Not to be outdone, history repeated itself more than three and a half centuries later when Antiochus the Great conquered Sardis in an eerily similar fashion employing the services of a sure-footed climber from Crete, ooh, that's a tongue twister, opened a way for the army to enter through an unguarded passageway in 195 BC. On top of that, in AD 17, there was a great earthquake that heavily damaged this city. Why is all that important? The city of Sardis had grown at times complacent in trusting their geographical position. And not only that, after this earthquake had damaged the city, Rome invested heavily in the rebuilding of it. And though it had a thriving industry of wool products, we'll talk about that in a second, including the dyeing of wool, it was clear, listen, that the greatness that once made up the city was now in the past. It was still going, but it was dying. It was still going, but the remnants of the greatness of the city were in the days before, not in the days ahead. This church uh, in Sardis, mo much like the other churches in this seven uh, church circuit, most likely was founded out of the preaching of Paul in Ephesus. You remember in Acts 20, it said he set up a school that for two years he preached and taught in this school. And out of that, people left that school and they started to found churches. That's a good model, by the way. It's why we equip and we train and we hope people leave here. And if they leave here, we hope that they go and help start churches or strengthen churches. But, but it got going. It, it seems like it, it had a measure of vibrancy, of vitality, of life. But after several years, several decades, it had grown stale and it had grown cold in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. For whatever reason, the church grew careless and indifferent over the years. And their decline was on the precipice of death. Apathy and complacency kill. Listen, spiritual drift in an individual life, a family life, or a church happens through a million little decisions or lack of decisions. Very rarely do you die this kind of death as an individual or, or a church over, overnight or immediately. It's, it's you're going, where did we go off track? It's that drift happened just, you make decision after decision, and over, over a decade time, now you're moving in this direction, you're going, what happened? How did that happen? It was unchecked. It was unevaluated. It happened slowly, but death was sure. Much like you've put a, a living frog in a kettle to cook it. I don't know if that's right, but if you put a frog in a kettle of lukewarm water and you turn up the heat, that frog is gonna cook in that water and not bounce out. If you put a frog in a boiling Kettle of water, what's that frog gonna do? He's gonna bounce out of there, but he will die a slow death if you just turn up the heat little by little. All that said, why are we talking about frogs and Blockbuster? Our, our goal then this morning is to identify how this complacency happens and what the steps any church needs to take to make sure that they stay revived, awake, and truly alive, okay? So if you're sleepy this morning, the conclusion's gonna be wake up. Okay, I'm just telling you, that's the conclusion Then we're gonna sing all I have is Christ. You're gonna hear it again, wake up. This is not the morning to sleep. If it is, go get some coffee and listen. Here it is, let's read together from Revelation chapter three, verses one to six. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains 
and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the, in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed, clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I'll remind you uh, that uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 talks through seven different churches on this, in this circle uh, in Asia Minor, in modern-day Turkey. And Sardis is the fifth church. We're a little bit out of order, but it's the fifth church that John addressed. Sardis is fascinating in that it shares similarities with Ephesus that Tim's going to address next week. That was an overall positive church, but had some things it needed to work on. And it shares some things with Laodicea, which was the worst church that we're going to cover each letter uh, starts, so what you'll, what you'll notice is each letter starts with a different description of Jesus. And so, and so here is no different. You'll notice Jesus is described in verse 1 this way, uh, the words of him who has in his hand, really, the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And, and here what we see, Jesus has the authority. He has the seven stars, which represents the seven, seven churches, in his hands, or seven messengers. He has, he has authority over the messengers, and he has control or authority over the seven spirits of God, which we took, looked at a while ago in Isaiah chapter 11, uh, verse 2 and Zechariah 4 and 10, we believe that the seven spirits of God represents the Holy Spirit. And so Christ even has authority to dispense the Holy Spirit to this church. Why is that so important for this church to know? For a church that was mostly dead, which means it's somewhat alive, but a church that is mostly dead doesn't need a miracle they need, they need the Holy Spirit. They need the power of the Holy Spirit to take hold. And Christ made that power readily available to them. Listen, just as individuals, there is no neutrality with individuals, right? We're either walking by the Spirit or we're walking by the flesh. There's no such thing as spiritual neutrality. There's no such thing as you saying, how are you doing in your walk with the Lord? Eh, eh, I'm okay. Ah, eh. There is no eh in scripture. You're either walking by the spirit in vibrant relationship with him or you're walking by the what? Flesh. And it will be evident by what is being produced in your life. Just like that happens with individuals, that happens with churches. Churches that are walking by the spirit will have healthy things come out of it. Those that are now in complacency walking in the flesh will have like things come out of it as well. Most churches of the seven, of these seven churches, were given accommodation by Jesus for their work. Danny covered that last week in Thyatira. There were some good things, good work going on in Thyatira. They just had a, they had a fix, definitely some teaching there. But here, the church at Sardis was betrayed or even uh, revealed by their works. It was clear that this church had a name or a reputation in the city as a church that was alive and vibrant. In other words, if you would ask somebody, hey, in Sardis, what do you think of this, this little church over here in Sardis? Man, it's pretty good. Like, they're doing some good things. They got some good things going on, and, you know, they've been a blessing to our city, and, and it seems like it's, it's good. It's good. They had a, they had a reputation. Perhaps this was uh, from the beginning or the founding times that had been built on a strong foundation in this city, but the outsiders of the church look fondly at it, but then Jesus uttered this damnable message. 
Can you imagine if Jesus said this to you? Like, I know your works and I know you have a good reputation, but you, my friend, are muerte. You are dead. And when he says dead here, that's not, that's not slight, that's not a little bit. You are spiritually bankrupt and dead. I mean, that is a huge statement. You gotta let that sink in, that this church had a good reputation, they were doing good stuff, and Jesus looked at it and said, you are dead. And the question is, how did this happen? How does that happen? How does this happen to a church that at one point was vibrant, now, and it's not even Jesus says, man, you gotta fix a couple things, you gotta gotta do a little more, you gotta do a little better, you gotta tweak a couple things. Nope, you are on the precipice of death. How does this happen to a church? Well, I don't think the text necessarily tells us, but I think the Bible informs us of some other ways that we understand of how does this happen? How does does complacency happen in a church? How would a church in a modern day get to a point where Jesus would look at it and says, your works and your reputation seem like they're good, but inside you're really dead. I I think there's five, four, four reasons why that happens. First, there's a lack of recognition of a focus of on self, on our self. The church is not described, it's fascinating. Most of the other churches, where were they finding pressure? They were finding pressure from the outside of, persecu- of, of being persecuted, in which case Jesus says, hold fast. Like, hold fast, it's gonna get harder, you're gonna get persecuted, but hold fast. Some were facing false teaching, and what, is, what does John say or Jesus say to false teaching? You gotta, you gotta get rid of it, you gotta correct it. Here, there wasn't false teaching, there wasn't persecution, there was just bleh. But what was happening was, there was this over-realized view of self, I believe. Why do I say that? When Paul, earlier in 1 Timothy, chapter five, verses five to six, he addressed the city or the church at Ephesus in terms of widows. And here's what Paul said about the difference between a widow who's a righteous widow who should be taken care of the church, taken care of by the church, and a widow who shouldn't be. And here's the difference. The one who should be, she is truly, she who is truly a widow left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. In other words, an uh, over-focus on self creates this this zombie-like state. You're a dead man walking. You're alive and you're doing things, but internally you're dead. When we are self-indulgent, when the focus is all on me, all on us, all on not the things God has called us to, but on us personally or us as a church, death comes and comes quickly. A church that's only focused, that has individuals only focused on themselves, what I get out of church, how comfortable that place makes me. What, what do they have for me, for me at that church is a church that gets self-focused and, and, and is dead while it's, while it's still alive. Folks, listen, is church really about you? The answer is no. You know why? Because life isn't about you. Life's about Christ and others. You rank behind those things. And so as a church, we, we don't come to a church to be entertained. We don't come to a church because we get stuff out of it. We come to a church because we've been made alive by Jesus Christ to worship him and to serve others and build up the body. That's why you're here. So when you mix those priorities up, that is a recipe for death. Second, they had a focus they had a focus on their past reputation, on their past reputation. Again, the church was laid, it seems like, on a really good foundation, and they could look, take a look at the past and go, man, we used to do these things, we've always done these things, this is the way it's always been, so we're going to keep doing it that way, but they were just, they were just trading in on somebody else's faithfulness. 
They looked at the past instead of evaluating the present to move forward into the future. When a church tries to merely preserve what it used to be, it is primed for death. It's why I've talked about now, Lord has been gracious to us to be able to pay off this building, but I've said for years, our goal wasn't to do a big collection from you guys to try to pay off this building, because we've watched it over and over again. When a church sometimes pays off its property, it's like taking a poison pill and you kill yourself because you start to try to preserve and preserve what you have instead of moving forward into what God would have you to do in the future. We've seen it happen over and over again. We don't do things, listen, we don't do things here because we've always done them that way. That doesn't mean we change it just because we've always done it that way, but just because so-and-so did it that way 20 years ago or five years ago or used to work 20 years ago or five years ago is not the reason you keep doing it. Again, not, the, not necessarily the reason you change it, but you should evaluate it in moving forward. Third, they had a focus on what outsiders thought of them, or a church today would focus on what outsiders think of us. Now, I wanna be careful here. You gotta listen, listen to all that I say here. Does a church's reputation in the community matter? Does, a, does our reputation as a church matter in our community? Does our, does our reputation as a church matter in our community? Okay, it does. But, listen, it absolutely does. But here is the caveat. Listen to me. Our good reputation in the community is not our mission. Our reputation in the community is not our mission. In other words, our goal is to reach people with the gospel and to magnify Jesus Christ. This clearly entails that we live out our new life in Christ with kindness, taking care of orphans and widows, feeding the hungry, aiding the hurting, visiting the lonely, pursuing the broken, etc. But social issues are not our primary goal, but should always be resultative of a life lived for Christ. Listen. If social issues become the primary goal, then what happens to accomplish that goal is that we're willing to sacrifice the actual gospel to get there. I talked with a man uh, several years ago. I spoke at a benefit dinner uh, for a nonprofit organization. And I got to share the story of how God preserved my wife when she had a stroke, and all the things that went along with that, and how God's good hand was on her, how uh, God taught us about joy and confidence and assurance in the future. And, uh, and this was with a bunch of lawyers and doctors and people with big money. And, and I had a board member of this nonprofit. He goes, we used to talk that way about this nonprofit, but now our focus is just on the business and keeping the business going. And it's a good nonprofit. See, when social issues become uh, the main thing, what gets sacrificed in the, in the offset is that we lose often the primary focus of our call, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's distinctive. The world, listen, the world will always call us to act like them, prodding us to try to come up with social solutions to sin problems. There is no such thing to a social solution to man's sin problem. The gospel radically changes society and brings justice, but does so through the life and death of Jesus Christ, knowing that anyone's greatest problem is not their social standing, but their rebellion against God, and that they are sitting under his sure judgment to come. This church at Sardis had a reputation of being active in their community, but they lost the message of Jesus Christ. And so are we to be engaged in people's suffering? Yes, 
for sure, and amen, and amen. But that is, a, that is a secondary part that plays beautifully out when we're accomplishing our primary mission of magnifying Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel. Fourth, good, well-meaning, dead people trying to do good things. Good, well-meaning, dead people trying to do good things. Is the church for everybody? <laughs> Is the church for everybody? I'm asking some really dumb questions, I must admit, because there's no really easy. Yeah, <laughs> Laura's like, yep, you are. Uh, is the church for everybody? The answer is yes and no. Is everybody welcome at church? Yes, thank you. Just by coming to a church, are you part of the church? What is the prerequisite to coming into my family? If you are my friends, if you're friends of my kids and you come over to my house, do you know what that makes you? Your friends. If you marry one of my daughters, what does that make you? Family. Family. There is a prerequisite to being part of my family. You either, either need to be adopted into my family or you need to be married into my family. Those are the two entry gates. There is one entry gate to becoming a member of the church. I'm not saying this church, of Jesus' church, and that's through the gateway of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Other than that, you're a visitor and a friend and amen and amen. Do we, do we love everybody in God's church? Yes. Is everybody who attends church part of the church? The answer is no. Far too often, far too often, people subtly believe that attendance at a church equates to or contributes to salvation. This is both detrimental to the individual and to the corporate church. To the individual, it's, it's like saying, uh, I'm giving you a Dixie cup full of water to try to put out a forest fire. And you're going to keep throwing that Dixie cup and, and reloading it and, and, and reloading it, trying to throw it on the forest fire. But after a while, you get singed and burned and you're going to die because you, have, you, can't, you can't stop that fire. Individuals that think attendance at a church somehow saves them is, is not a loving message to give to people. It's actually a hateful message saying, yeah, just come here and you're fine with the Lord when you haven't dealt with your sin personally before God through Jesus Christ. And at Sardis, we saw a vivid picture that when a church is made up primarily of unbelievers who are well-meaning, well-intentioned, trying their best, it is actually a pathway of death for the whole church. They were good, well-meaning, active people in their culture and society, and yet Jesus said they are dead. They're dead. Why? Let's look at this next section. The command to the church exclaimed. We're going to see why that is here in verses 2 and 3. Read with me real quickly in verses 2 and 3 again. Wake up. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know the hour of which I come against you. So what does Jesus address in the, the rest of this letter or here in these verses is how they overcome this apathy, this indifference, and this complacency. We've said before that the church as a whole and this church is always reforming. We want to be a church that's always reforming. And what I mean by that is not that we think we're doing something wrong, so we need to change that. We realize that drift is, is possible, that drift happens far too often. And so we're always examining, making sure we're not actually drifting from the scripture and the doctrine that we know to be true. And so we're always, reforming isn't trying to change things to go into the future. It's actually trying to make sure we're anchored to the truth of the past so that we can, we can live and teach and move forward. A reforming church is not afraid to evaluate and persistent evaluation sets us up for revitalization, revitalization or revival, which any church that has been around for over five years needs to engage in. Churches need to be revived and reform themselves because we've, we're a church that's been around 60 plus years. And, and, and it takes very few years for us to die a slow death. 
So the messenger here gives five principles of revival for the complacent church, each of them informative for us today. Here they are. Here are the five real quickly. The first is this. Ready? Wake up. You see that? Wake up. Who needs to wake up? If you, if you say wake up, man, I have teenage daughters now. They can sleep. My goodness. I, I, I can't, it's partly because my body's breaking down. I can't sleep past a certain time in the morning and they could sleep literally until I wake them up. And then it's really hard. It's like 10.30 in the morning. I'm like, wake up, my goodness. And they're like, I'm hungry. I know, because it's lunchtime. Where's the day gone? It's almost dinner time. I'm like, wow. When we come to Christ the first time, it is like we have been, like we've been woken up for the first time, forever. Moving from death to life, from blindness to sight, from slavery to freedom. When God gifted salvation for the first time, we didn't have to be compelled to love Christ. We didn't have to be strong-armed to read his Bible. We didn't have to be... Uh, uh, pushed into going to his church. It's like, do you remember what it was like to be saved for the first time? And say, man, my chains are gone. I've been set free that I don't have to work anymore for my salvation. I, I just know Jesus and I want to know him and make him known. We, we were woken up through this, through this sleep of our death in sin. Being born again means that we now understand the world anew our place in it, our purpose, and the hope of our future. But we can be so easily lulled into a sense of complacency, a been there, done that version of following Christ. For young people, you get lulled into this sense that following Christ will be a someday thing. That someday, someday when I move out of my parents' house, someday when I'm on my own, someday when I'm done spending hours playing video games and, and doing it. Someday I'll pursue him and I'll follow him. Others of us get lulled into thinking that, that there's a time and a place in our life with Christ that we can kind of check out and move on. That yes, we can retire from our work, but maybe we just retire from being an active part of the church and we just retire from, from pursuing Christ. Both those and everything in the middle draws us toward, toward complacency and not vibrancy. We all need to evaluate the excuses that we would make for our apathy and get back going. Second, he says to stand up or strengthen what remains. This idea is to support or stand something on its feet to make it strong. The idea of standing up is strengthening what remains as it borders, it teeters on the edge of death. The problem with the church at Sardis was not the quantity of their work, it was the quality of it. Romans 14, 23 says that anything we do that is not by faith is what? Is sin. Things done not out of faith. Any work that does not come out of a new life in Christ falls short of God's standard. And many on the day of judgment will point to all that they did as reason for God to accept them. But we know what Matthew 7 says. What does Matthew 7 say? Depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. We can't point to the things that we did on our own apart from faith as reason why Christ would accept us. How do we stand up then? We make sure that we are clear on the gospel and conversion, not leaving things up to assumption with anyone here. Conversion is the gateway to belonging in a church. Conversion is the pathway to actually please God and know him. If you're an unbeliever here this morning, do we want you to leave? By no means, we want you to get saved. We don't want you to leave. We want you to become part of God's family. We want you to know Jesus Christ. And it starts by you recognizing your sin and, and the inability that you have on your own to, to make yourself acceptable to God. That's, that's, that's the beauty of it, right? Is that, is that we can't do anything to earn salvation. We simply believe and repent of our sin to be saved. 
Waking up and strengthening what remains is as a church, we have to make sure that we're not giving false assurances to people who have been attending but have never bowed their knee to Jesus Christ. That's not loving to them and it's not helpful to the church. Third, remember when. Remember when. Notice here it says, uh, verse three, remember then what you received and what you heard. Reforming is not changing the fundamentals, but willing to change other things. Listen, as a church, we're changing. We're willing to change things, but not the fundamental things. We're not gonna change our theology. We're not gonna change the fact that we preach God's word. Those things will never change, but are we willing to change other things? Sure. We change music styles, we change clothes styles, we change technology things, like those are all fine. We're not trying to be blockbusters stuck in the past trying to use 1980s technology to scan somebody's membership card. But, but what churches have a problem with, why they drift is they say, we actually have to change the way we teach or change what we teach or change these hard doctrines to try to be relevant to our culture. That's when you drift away. Remember what you have heard and what you've seen. He's saying you already have the answer to the puzzle piece that you're looking for. How do you become alive? You get back to what you were doing in the beginning. Teaching of God's word is rarely seen as a good strategy for church growth, but it's always the remedy for church health and a healthy church will always grow. Fourth is keep it or restart it. Keep God's word, keep his commands. It's one thing to hear it, another thing to do it. This is a present imperative, which means keep on keeping it and never, never stop or retire from it. Complacency is something we all will struggle with. And so what's the remedy is we have to be vibrant or, or proactive in keeping God's word, no matter what age we find ourselves in. And last is repent or turn around. Repentance is a gift. It has to do with change, with turning of thinking, of desire and action. It acknowledges the need to change and proactively changes us by faith. It is more than simply feeling bad. Second Corinthians 7.10, feeling bad leads to death. It means that our mind and hearts are changed. The church at Sardis needed to change, which means they needed revival, which necessitated repentance on a corporate scale. This would have been hopeful, a hopeful acknowledgement of drift or a lack of true conversion and a coming and a, and a recognition of a coming of Christ. And here's, here's the warning that, that the messenger gave to the church. Listen, if you don't repent, if you don't turn, Christ is gonna come like a thief in the night and a thief always comes to destroy. He's gonna take away the church. He, can't, he won't take away salvation, but this church is on the precipice of that happening. Here's, here's the last thing in verses four to six. What's the hope to the church that, that Christ gave or extolled? Even being on the brink of death, there was always hope. In the most wayward of churches where true believers are, there's an opportunity for a turnaround. There were still a few, a faithful few, who had not been given over to selfish apathy and complacent vanity. Listen, it, it's a call to every person. Uh, I hope we have more than a few here that are that way, but it means that everybody has a role. Everybody has a responsibility. This isn't for other people, this is for us. Are we awake and alive and are we moving toward Christ or are we not? And here are three promises he gives that are hopeful and we'll close with this. The first is this, the worthy will be clothed in white. Notice what he says here, there's a few names still in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. They will walk with me in white for they are worthy. This didn't mean they were worthy, it meant that they were clothed in white, something that had been given to them and the white represented holiness. This was a, they had a big wool industry I told you about in Sardis. That was a new kind of textile industry that they hadn't had in the past, but now was vibrant. And so they knew the difference between pure white wool and that had been sullied by other things, by, by briars and, and dirt and those things. 
And the ones, it's fascinating to me that the ones who had the sullied garments weren't the ones who were, he didn't call out sexual morality like, like Thyatira. He didn't call out these other things. They just, they just had been lulled into indifference. And he goes, your garments have been sullied. You haven't pursued holiness. But the ones who remain, they weren't worthy in themselves. They're worthy because Christ made them worthy. And remember this, sometimes people ask this, like, how are you doing? And you're like, man, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And is that a good statement? I'm a sinner saved by grace. Is that good? Have you said that to somebody? Do you know that in your life? Is that a good statement? I'm a sinner saved by grace, but that's not all. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I've been given new righteousness by Christ to live holy and a new redeemed life. My focus isn't on my past sin saved by grace, praise the Lord, but now I can live holy and righteous and new in Christ. Don't forget that. Grace, yes, saved you in the past, but grace actually enlivens you to live a holy life for him now. Second, second promise or hope was their names will always stay in the book of life. Our names, once they're etched in the book of life, they will not be removed. This was not a call to some in the church saying, if you don't turn and you're truly saved, you're not gonna be saved in the future. There were some that were unsaved in the church that their names weren't written in there, but the ones whose names were written in the book of life, they would remain. Even if the church dissolved, they would remain safe and secure in Christ. Lastly, Jesus will confess their names before the Father. This is a direct allusion to Matthew 10, 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. This means that those who endure are those who confess Christ openly and those who do not are practically ashamed of Christ. This was the core issue at the city of Sardis is they had become complacent toward Christ, toward its word for sure, but they were ashamed of Christ. They did works in their community, but not because or motivated for or magnifying Jesus Christ. Maybe that was on their literature, on their letterhead. Maybe they had those things from past things, but but they had lost Christ. And Christ says, if you lose me, I'm not gonna stand before my father and confess you to my father. But if you're part of me, if you're in me, if you're with me, I'll confess you because you are mine. He who has an ear, ear, let them hear. In 1944, December, the Allied forces were six months out from an invasion in Normandy. They had pushed uh, eastward through France and Belgium, and they found themselves, the GIs found themselves in the dead of winter in the forest forest of the Ardennes. And in the Ardennes forest, uh, they, they had... Great victory after great victory came at a high cost, but they said, our enemy is reeling. They had just lost on the Eastern Front in Stalingrad. Uh, The winter had set in, no one attacks in the winter. And so soldiers began to welcome in entertainment from the outside who would be flown in. They started to train other troops. They started to get some rest and they grew complacent. They thought no one would be foolish enough to attack in the winter, they forgot they were their enemy was a foolish, crazy man. Hitler, Hitler created a, a full frontal attack with panzer tanks uh, called the Battle of the Bulge and ran through the lines of the Allied forces because they weren't prepared and they were complacent. They forgot that they were, attack, they were, they were fighting a crazy man who had already been defeated but didn't know it yet. Listen, we have an enemy who's already been defeated, Amen. Satan has no power. He's our enemy, but he's defeated. But is he going to take down as many as he can, even if it costs him everything? For sure. And you know what? The one thing our enemy would love this church to do is to become complacent in what we've done in the past and simply live and get distracted by all the things of life instead of a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. This study of the church at Sardis has been fascinating to me because it hits us exactly where we're at in history today. Let's not grow complacent, indifferent, or apathetic, but let's be woken up. Let's wake up to the things of Christ. Let's make sure that we stay vibrant, that we remember, that we, that we keep it, that we repent where we need to repent so that we can continue on, not just now, but in perpetuation.
We're gonna sing about Christ now in all, one of my favorite songs, All I Have is Christ, on the way out. And on the way out, you can grab some thank you notes to Tim and Sue, but let's, let's close with this. Let's close with thanking our Savior, our Lord, because all we have is Christ, and that's enough. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this reflection on the city and the church at Sardis. Thank you for faithful brothers and sisters there, this faithful few who are faithful to the end. We know the city closed. We know the church closed, but you save souls there. And I ask, Lord, that we would learn the lessons that we need to learn from this dear church, that we would not simply be known by a reputation, but be known because of Jesus Christ, that we would point people to Christ, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that yes, we would be engaged in social things, but, but not as a primary means that we would be focused on the gospel and people's souls and, and then becoming redeemed and reconciled. Thank you that you change us, that you don't leave us alone. Thank you that you give us the Holy Spirit that we need who guides and directs and convicts us. We ask that your spirit would work now. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.